个呃自己演讲座是我们这一期的最后一次演讲座啊，天气虽然非常寒冷，但是我们到这里来了，感受到大家的这个温暖。谢谢大家。那么今天呢，我把嗯现在把这个主讲人克里夫德科布博士的情况简单的向大家做一个介绍。科布先生，他是美国非常著名的生态经济学家啊，他主要是研究社会公共政策、可持续发展还有土地问题啊。他早年是毕业于加州大学伯克利分校。现在是呃美国的一个非常著名的这个基金会，上普巴克基金会的主席。他同时也是中国后现代发展研究院的高级研究员。那么这个地方啊、呃，列举出了他的几个比较有名的著作啊，一个是《通向正义之路：亨利·乔治的哲学与经济学》，那么还有一个《绿色国民生产》，还有一个《系统教育改革：一个社群主义的方案》。啊，那么他的一些经历呢，在九九年的时候，应丹麦政府邀请，帮助起草这个政府提交给联合国的发展报告。九四年创建美国旧金山社会政治思想库，重新建立进步。九五年担任克林顿总统可持续发展委员会委员，在二零零四年的时候被嗯评为二十世界嗯、呃、最有洞见的思想家之一。那么我们知道还有一个非常有名的作者，就是《寂静的春天》作者。他们是一并选为这个有贡献的思想家的。那科布先生，他由于非常不满美国社会贫富的这种两极分化、高度的两极分化，以及由此带来的社会问题，所以，哎，他一直多年来就是致力于美国近代的这个改革家乔治啊，亨利·乔治的思想研究。他特别关注世界的范围的贫困问题、土地问题、社会问题。正义问题、可持续发展问题，那么他自己是试图在亨利·乔治思想的这样一个基础上，结合马克思关于正义的理论，找出一种双赢的可持续的发展道路。那么啊，克里夫人他是非常热爱中国的，而且他毕生都是将自己的这个啊全部的这种精力放在推动可持续发展问题上面。那么他自己也是一个身体力行的环保主义者，他是从来不开车的。啊，过得非常节俭、节约的这样一个节俭的、简朴的生活。然后，他是，当然是非常关心我们中国的现代化建设。啊，曾经多次访问中国。啊，实际上这并不是他第一次来华盛顿大学。啊，在二零零五年的时候就已经来过了。啊，那么这次是应哲学系的邀请，在我们这里做访学。啊，那么进行这个学术交流。把他的一些思想啊带给我们。好，那么现在欢迎客户，可以走出去。
thinks about economics only as a series of technical problems, it will inevitably follow the lead of the West. If China is to chart a new course, it must do so on the basis of a new way of thinking. China has a chance to follow a new direction because of its traditions. There is much of value in the Confucian tradition. Its intellectual flexibility permitted China to incorporate Buddhist teachings from India and modern science from the West at two critical periods in China's history. Its concept of natural order enabled China to establish a largely self-governing social structure that minimized the need for direct government control. In addition, Confucian thought provided a basis of legitimacy and stability for government for over 2,000 years, a record far surpassing any other system of governance in the world. It did so in part by formulating an ideal of government that transcended or went beyond any particular emperor. At the same time, China's recent socialist tradition contains valuable elements that should be retained. Although China, under Mao Zedong, never achieved economic and social equality, socialism permanently eliminated the belief in the superiority of men over women or of aristocrats over commoners. Any new set of economic principles will have to strive for a relatively equal distribution of opportunity to avoid returning to the pervasive social elitism found in China before 1949. Aside from Confucianism and Socialism, there are certainly other traditions in China that can provide assistance in developing a positive framework for development. It is impossible for China to consider its future without taking into account its past. That does not mean that China should try to copy any of its traditions exactly. That is never possible. But the closer any reform is to a tradition, the more likely it will be to succeed. Since the late Qing Dynasty and the Republican era, when intellectuals began looking at Western models of development, many Chinese thinkers have expressed a desire to bypass the process of modernization by moving directly to a society based on new principles. This hope continues today. Chinese theorists want the positive aspects of the Western experience without the negative ones. Economic development without unemployment. Mobility without pollution or traffic jams. Democracy without political uncertainty. Nationalism without foreign wars. In effect, they do not want to be bound by the internal conflicts of modernity. Although no nation has yet found a way to escape those conflicts, many scholars in the West and in China have developed an interest in postmodern thought. In the West, this has been largely an intellectual game 
but for China, the stakes are much higher. The issue for developing nations is not merely whether certain academic problems in philosophy can be solved by rethinking the assumptions of modernity. The question for China is whether postmodern ideas might enable it to avoid the problems caused by modernization while retaining the benefits of modernization. If that aim is to be realized, Chinese scholars need to be selective in their acceptance of postmodern thought. Deconstructive forms of postmodernism are purely critical and focus almost entirely on the way language shapes thought. They deny the superiority of scientific methods in any context. Deconstruction may serve a purpose in challenging some arrogant forms of modern thought that were previously unquestioned. However, if China is to use postmodernism in building a new society, its scholars are more likely to find support in constructive postmodernism, which offers a different approach than deconstructive approaches. So much of what I will talk about here is the difference between constructive and deconstructive types of postmodernism. Before going any further, I need to explain that I am using the word modern to refer to a set of ideas that emerged in Europe in the 17th century. It is not a synonym for recent or new. Modern thought is characterized by two basic principles. One, fragmentation, and two, mechanistic relations. Knowledge is produced by analysis, breaking things into component parts and studying each part in detail. The interaction of those parts is entirely mechanical. In modern thought, social and psychological models are all implicitly based on the metaphor of the machine. In medicine, economics, sociology, and other disciplines, researchers build up knowledge by learning how each part works. There is no need to develop a synthetic framework for these fragments of knowledge. To know all of the parts and the role they play is automatically to know the whole. Modern thought also presupposes the free will of individuals. This assumption poses endless problems because it means society is understood in two contradictory ways, as a machine and as a sum of people with free will. Nevertheless, both methods are based on the principle of fragmentation, a world divided into separate units, either as subjects, people with free will, or as objects, everything else. Because the world is conceived as a machine, one may imagine standing outside it altogether and viewing it objectively. Historically, this has led modern thinkers to construct systems of thought that gave the illusion of encompassing and controlling actual conditions with near perfection. Thus, modern thought 
has a tendency to encourage arrogance, pride. Deconstructive postmodernism questions modernity at the level of language. The deconstructionists argue that objectivity is totally an illusion. They emphasize that all thought takes place within language, which is constructed out of a set of self-reinforcing and self-referencing cultural conventions. By contrast, modern thought fails to recognize that it is tied to a particular set of linguistic conventions and thus ignores the ways in which the truths it formulates are bound to particular cultures. One of the consequences of deconstruction is cultural relativism, the idea that no perspective, no culture, captures the truth contained in different cultures or discourses. This is both the strength and weakness of deconstruction. It offers a means of attacking the arrogance of many Western thinkers, but it undermines its capacity to generate any cross-cultural statements or universal principles on even a provisional basis. Since it undercuts itself, deconstruction can never form the basis of a practical alternative mode of social transformation. In this respect, despite its aura of radicalism, its appearance of radicalism, deconstruction actually plays a very conservative role in politics by criticizing all constructive policies with equal vigor. Constructive postmodernism also criticizes modernity, but not primarily at the level of language. Rather, it begins with an intuition that all events are connected through mutual feelings and that the modern assumption of fragmentation is wrong. From this orientation, there are no freestanding objects in the world, no inert lumps of matter, no things. Everything is active. Each being is constituted by its relations to other things. People do not exist as separate entities or sources of will and desire. Again, this is the constructive postmodern view. People do not exist as separate entities or sources of will and desire. Instead, each person is composed of the significant people in his or her life. Thus, constructive postmodernism <laughs> begins with the assumption that a person's character is a product of what Buddhists call codependent origination, a changing flux of events. Everything is inside everything else to some extent. In addition, constructive postmodernism posits that biological organisms, populations, and cultural groups have emergent features. That means capacities or behaviors that cannot be predicted simply by knowing the component elements of the whole system. As a consequence of these distinctive premises, constructive postmodernism <coughs> offers a way of resolving 
some of the intellectual puzzles of modern thought and some practical problems in social development. A few general examples may help to explain this. First, if a person or self does not exist in isolation, but is constituted by its relations, the problem of developing a social ethic that balances individual rights and social stability is diminished. The problem is not eliminated because some tension still remains in constructive postmodernism between order and freedom. Nevertheless, constructive postmodernism disputes the modern assumption that all forms of group life limit the expression of individual will. A postmodern understanding of society emphasizes that group life is ambiguous. It gives freedom and at the same time it takes away freedom. Family and community both sustain and diminish individual development in complex ways. Second, since the constructive postmodernists agree with the deconstructionists that no perspective stands outside the system being observed, this approach also stands firmly on the side of pluralism and relativism against all modern forms of false certainty and arrogant intellectual imperialism. This does not mean that constructive postmodernism can prevent empire building by nations or intellectual <coughs> movements. But its proponents are unlikely to lend their names to either theories or practices that promote that sort of arrogance. Like the best elements of many religious traditions, constructive postmodernism has a built-in method of self-criticism in the form of a pluralistic approach to all problems. Although there is some overlap in the concerns of two types of postmodernism, there is also divergence. I cannot expand further on the differences. My aim is to discuss a few features of constructive postmodernism as they relate to practical issues in China's development. In the following discussion, when I refer to postmodernism, I always mean constructive postmodernism, unless I specifically refer to deconstructive forms. Because Chinese scholars have never embraced modern thought as fully as Western scholars, many of the former have begun to find value in constructive postmodernism. Confucianism and other forms of Chinese thought never separated subject and object, or self and the world, as sharply as modern thought has done. As a result, there are some important affinities or connections between Chinese tradition and postmodernism. Both reject the pretense of intellectual certainty. Both reject purely mechanistic explanations of human phenomena. Both re reject extreme forms of individualism and both reject technical forms of rationality that are divorced or separated from ethical considerations. 
both the Chinese traditions and constructive postmodernism embrace pluralism, relativity, and an interactive understanding of selfhood. In the following discussion of practical problems facing China, another feature of postmodernism is particularly important. To be postmodern means to be inclusive, whereas modern thought began in the 17th century by rejecting tradition, postmodernism once again embraces tradition. It also embraces the technical knowledge gained from modern scientific methods. True postmodernism does not reject any source of knowledge or understanding. Thus, I am proposing that China needs to draw upon three sources, various Chinese traditions, modern scientific thought, and a postmodern approach that synthesizes old and new ideas. As a way of considering the direction China should take in economic policy, I am going to analyze three issues and the lessons that might be learned from a postmodern approach that combines both traditional wisdom and modern knowledge. The three issues are property rights, planning, and authority. So I will go through those now. Property rights, planning, and authority are the three topics. First, property rights. The feature that most clearly defines a modern economy is property, and more specifically, the ownership of productive assets. In a traditional society, property ownership involved a reciprocal obligation, either between client and patron or between household and village. A household would pay to use land, and the patron or village leader would provide collective services. The use of land was governed by tradition which might not correspond with the most productive use of the land. In a modern society, property is owned outright by a distinct entity, an individual, a collective, a business, or a government agency. Land use is governed by private decisions and by public laws. Tradition is no longer enforceable. But the most important feature of modern property rights is their separation from collective obligations. As a result, modern property systems lead to social inequality. Socialism attempted to rectify the problems associated with modern property by transforming ownership from private hands into collectives. In many ways, this system was similar to the old patron-client relationship of pre-modern villages, but with party officials playing the role that village leaders and city bosses once played. In effect, the state claimed all of the significant property rights and promised to care for everyone in return. But by monopolizing property rights, the state also interfered with productivity and made everyone poor. In China, support for socialism slowly declined as a result of the faltering economy. 
its failure discredited any form of collective ownership. However, there is no reason to believe that it also discredited all forms of reciprocity. New forms of ownership, particularly by township and village enterprises, have emerged in China since 1978. These are similar in many respects to the old system under which the leaders of lineages or clans held rights on behalf of members. These enterprises are exclusive to outsiders, which means they operate as private businesses. They also have some characteristics of common ownership for insiders. However, property rights in China are decisively private. The crucial feature is that enterprise managers have enough security of tenure to make investments and receive rewards for their efforts. In the process of adopting private property rights, China has experienced the same benefits and problems as Western countries. Productivity has increased but so have economic inequality and poverty. If China permits property rights to be monopolized by a small portion of the population, social conflict will increase and support for the government will decline. China needs to develop a postmodern conception of property rights that would balance modern exclusivity, that is, private ownership, and traditional reciprocity, that is, common ownership. To gain political support, that balance must be regarded as just. The division of property rights must be based on the sources of economic value. In the West, there has been a strong bias in favor of the idea that all value is produced inside particular units of production. Both traditional Chinese philosophy and socialist theory dispute that assumption about the source of value. Even if they do not address the question of value directly, they imply that a great deal of value is produced by society. A postmodern conception of property rights would recognize that some value is produced privately and some is generated socially. There are two types of property that deserve special attention with respect to the source of value, land and intellectual property. In the first case, the value of land is entirely determined by its location, and the value of location is purely a social product. The development of any parcel of land increases the value of nearby land. This social process of value creation particularly occurs in large cities on the coast or along major rivers. If society creates that value, society should receive that value. It could do so easily by leasing public land and taxing private owners of land and then using the revenue as a major source of government funding. This proposal by Henry George in 1879 was later adopted by Sun Zhongshan in 1922 as part of his land rights program. 
there are larger consequences of treating this value as if it were produced privately. Japan's economic stagnation and the Asian financial crisis of 1997-98 and the current global financial crisis today. All of them were caused partly by leaving the value of land, of urban land, in private hands. In addition, permitting the privatization of land values causes economic inequality, growing differences between rich and poor households and rich and poor regions. Inequality will also hurt the economy by creating a large class of people too poor to buy the products of Chinese factories. If socially produced wealth is shared, however, the internal market of China will grow, and China will not be dependent on exports to sustain its economy. This is an important factor in maintaining China's national sovereignty. One of the big problems today with China's economy is it depends on exports, especially in Guangdong province. So there is high rising unemployment there because China has depended too much on exports and not enough on an internal market. To create an internal market means raising the income of poor people. The second question of value is how to treat intellectual property, books, music, computer programs, and mechanical inventions. If this property is treated as entirely social, then inventors have no incentive, no reason, to share their ideas with others. If intellectual property is treated as entirely individual, there is no recognition of the fact that ideas emerge from a social background, not simply from private individuals. This gives too much reward to a person such as Bill Gates of Microsoft. If China decides that most value is created socially, it will have to fight for it in the WTO, the World Trade Organization, because it currently defends the principle that the value of intellectual property is produced mostly by individuals. Value that is produced socially cannot be traced to a simple location. That value logically belongs to the people of an entire country, or even the entire world. Within China, the differential productivity of people in Tianjin, Shanghai, and the Guangzhou Shenzhen region, region is not due to their individual differences, but to locations that enable those cities to capture value created throughout the entire country. At present, the major cities along the coast are absorbing much of the social surplus, but they do not deserve it. The benefits of economic progress should be shared between city and countryside and among all regions and households. This sharing does not need to be done in the same way as it was under Mao Zedong. There is a different way to do it. A postmodern approach balances private and common rights by allowing all labor value 
to be retained by households and requiring social value to be taken as taxes. Unlike socialist policies, this will provide an incentive for investment and growth. There is some urgency in deciding all of these issues of value. If China simply adopts the modern concept of individual property rights, it will make all of the same mistakes as the Western nations. If, however, China can find a postmodern way of thinking about property rights, it may be able to avoid the pitfalls that have trapped other nations. Now, the second example of how constructive postmodernism can help think about economic problems. The second issue is economic planning. Planning is a purely modern concept. It is based on the premise that it is possible to manage an economy or society to some extent. Traditional societies function on the basis of social habits. They were generally oriented toward the past rather than the future. There was also an implicit assumption that society functioned like an organism that could heal its own ailments without the involvement of the state. A postmodern approach to planning can draw on both traditional trust in natural balance and on modern instruments of management. Western attitudes toward economic planning can be found along a continuum. The two poles of that continuum are libertarianism, no planning, and two, micromanagement, or detailed planning. Although every government actually operates a mixed economy at some point between these two along the continuum, the only way to understand the choices is by examining the two poles. The first pole represents pure individual freedom, unconstrained by government. I call this pole libertarian. In recent years, there has been a strong movement throughout the world towards an unplanned economy, leaving everything to market forces. That presupposes the existing, that existing property rights are equitable, and that government does not need to do anything to prevent extremes of inequality. One form of this libertarian view even treats the law as a product of contending individual preferences. The basic principles of libertarian thought are that exchanges are purely private transactions and that any involvement by government constitutes interference. This pole of the continuum tends toward anarchism, the belief or idea, the view that the elimination of government would be beneficial. The other pole involves detailed control of the economy using need rather than price as the method of allocating resources. I call this poll socialism. According to socialist thought, detailed management is necessary in order to avoid the inequality that arises in a free market setting. This involves a large state bureaucracy to implement the regulation of many areas of the economy. In practice, achieving that level of control 
has meant government ownership of large sectors of the economy, particularly banking, energy production, transportation, healthcare, and heavy industry. In China, it also meant heavy taxation of peasants to subsidize heavy industry, and it meant shortages of urban housing and other consumer goods. Neither pole of the continuum has worked very well. One side increases productivity, that's the libertarian, at the expense of causing inequality and social unrest. The other side, the socialist side, reduces inequality at the expense of destroying incentives for personal effort and risk. The idea of the mixed economy is a compromise between the two poles, but it is still the product of modern oppositional thinking. So, I am not, not recommending a mixed economy. I am not proposing a mixed economy. The failure of these polarities is not an accident. They both lead to the breakdown of social systems because they are based on a faulty model. They are both drawn from the image of a machine with independent, replaceable parts. The libertarian and the socialist agree at the level of basic philosophy that the economy is nothing more than a collection of individual units. If there is a problem, it must lie within one of those units. The socialist planner disagrees with the libertarian only about the wisdom of intervening to correct problems that arise. A postmodern approach starts from a different premise than both libertarianism and socialism. Postmodernism is holistic. It is based on an organic model of social relationships, which contains some mechanistic elements. The distinctive feature of an organic system is that it operates on different levels of order, with each level of order nested in a higher level. Thus, societies reveal emergent characteristics that cannot be inferred directly from the behavior of the individuals in them. In other words, the whole economy has a character that is different from the individuals in it. Unemployment, for example, represents a failure of the whole system, not the individuals within it. It is cruel and unfair to blame individuals for their inability to find work when the whole system, when the whole economy is contracting, shrinking, growing smaller. It is also pointless to direct the behavior of individuals within the system as the socialist proposes because the biggest problems transcend individual behavior. They are problems of the system, not the individual. A crucial feature of the holistic or postmodern approach to planning is that it is indirect, indirect, and embraces paradox, conclusions that are the opposite of common sense. An intervention that might seem superficially to help 
will actually cause harm. As in traditional Chinese medicine, the postmodern planner is not looking for mechanistic causes that lie in direct proximity to symptoms. Postmodern thinking teaches us to look for an imbalance in the whole system and to look for unexpected solutions. Again, as in Chinese medicine, these solutions are not intrusive. But just as in Chinese medicine, the Chinese medicine takes the body as a whole and says, what is wrong with the whole, not some little part, and tries to solve the problem of the whole. That's the idea, the postmodern idea, of solving economic problems, too. For example, when John Maynard Keynes proposed that government should spend more than its income because that would restore balance in the economic system as a whole and thereby reduce unemployment. Since saving is the way for individuals to accumulate wealth, the idea that a society could become wealthy, could spend itself into prosperity, was paradoxical. He said, spend more money and you'll have more money. It may, it, his proposal seemed absurd to economists, both then and now, but it worked. This is precisely why economics will be one of the last professions to embrace postmodern thinking. Economists will never understand, I think. <laughs> to those trained in modern thought, the solutions derived from a postmodern approach will always appear inappropriate, strange, crazy, absurd, paradoxical. But what matters is they work. That is the pragmatic test of truth. A small adjustment at the right point in any complex system can bring it back into alignment. In the economy, this can be done with tax policy or monetary policy. So, if you want to know what I am proposing, it's contained in the second sentence. Tax policy and monetary policy. If with an extra hour, I can tell you details, but not tonight, I think. <laughs> Thus, postmodern planning offers a new synthesis that can simultaneously maximize personal freedom, as the libertarian wishes, and prevent the causes of social disorder, as the socialist wishes. Everyone can have what they want. A mixed economy, some point in between libertarian and socialist thought, cannot do this. A postmodern planner succeeds by finding a point that does not correspond to any mixture of the two polar options. It is not somewhere in between. It is off the line. For China, the transition to a postmodern understanding of planning should not be as difficult as it will be in the West. China has a rich tradition of systemic, non-mechanistic thinking in philosophy and medicine. The task for Chinese intellectuals is to devise a new way of thinking 
about society and economy that captures the best elements of Western mechanistic models, which continue to have some value, as well as the best elements of traditional Chinese thought, which will open the way to greater appreciation of paradox, ambiguity, and irony. The third issue related to the future of the future success of the Chinese economy is legitimacy or authority. Western economists never ask questions about these issues. They simply assume that someone else takes responsibility to think about this problem. By authority, I mean public acceptance of some concept of natural or religious order that gives meaning to the role of governing institutions. Authority is distinct from, different from, power. Power means the capacity to coerce, to make someone do something. A government may have power, but little authority, if it does not have, if it lacks a coherent story of how its rules are connected to the natural order. Let us consider for a moment what would happen to an economy without authority, with no connection to natural order. First, the currency would have no value because the value of money depends entirely on the authority of the government that backs it. During historical periods, when there was no central authority and no system of money and credit, trade was limited to barter. Second, it is impossible to collect taxes in the absence of political authority. Although a government can collect some taxes with coercion, a sustainable fiscal relationship between government and people must be based on a general belief in the legitimacy of the government. Without the authority to collect taxes, government cannot provide even the most basic services, defense, roads, water, and so on. Third, the legal system ultimately depends on its legitimacy. Unless citizens and businesses can depend on the legal system to support claims they consider just or legitimate, they will be reluctant to make investments and take other risks. Thus, the economy will suffer in this way from lack of authority. For any society, no issue is more pressing than locating a source of authority for the actions of individuals and institutions. But the pursuit of authority is unlike any other issue. In traditional societies, there was no need to think about authority because it existed without question. Modern thought created the problem by denying the value of tradition and imposing reason, reason, as the sole or only source of authority. But reason cannot be a source of authority. It generates a multiplicity of interests, each contending for more power. Contrary to the faith of Enlightenment philosophers in England and France, 
reason cannot sustain democracy. It cannot sustain society. Reason alone cannot tame interests, so a society without traditional sources of authority swings back and forth from anarchy to repression and back to anarchy. To resolve the inner tensions of democracy, there must be an object of authority or loyalty beyond the groups within society. That source of authority cannot be justified with rational argument. As the political philosopher Hannah Arendt wrote, the source of authority is always a force external and superior to government. This external force transcends the political realm. The question now is whether it is possible to frame a set of ideas and images that will provide authority for particular governments. This involves a search for traditions that can command both loyalty and intellectual respect at the same time. This difficult task may be the most important for constructive postmodern thought. It is a task well suited for its combination of storytelling, tolerance of ambiguity, and intellectual synthesis of multiple strands of tradition. The need for this work on the discovery of a basis of authority is not unique to China. The disintegration of authority is also a growing problem in Western countries. It is not obvious because there is continuity of government. But the legitimacy of every government in the world is now being questioned more and more each year. Basic institutions are slowly eroding as a result. If China is to avoid that problem, it must develop a basis of authority. It seems highly unlikely that Marxism can provide it. Can Confucianism alone supply the necessary authority? Can some combination of traditions provide what China needs today? I don't know the answer. I am confident, however, that if Chinese intellectuals do not discover a basis of authority, China's problems will continue to grow as they do in the West. In modern societies, there is a tendency to see economic failures as technical problems that can be fixed in the same way that a motor can be repaired. This view is particularly strong in the United States. There is very little sense of the ways in which an economic system presupposes a larger set of social institutions. As a result, the conversation about economics in the West considers only a narrow range of issues. To broaden the conversation about economics, I have discussed three of the core issues facing every economy in the world today. Property, planning, and authority. These may seem like very abstract issues, but they have very concrete effects. The choices made by people and governments on these and similar issues will determine how evenly wealth is distributed, how many people are unemployed, and how many suffer from acute poverty. 
policies will be based on what is considered true or real and the philosophical premises with which scholars and officials begin their investigations will largely determine the outcomes. I have tried to offer some suggestions about how a constructive postmodern approach might contribute to thinking about the crucial theoretical issues of economics. Although many forms of postmodernism in the West are purely skeptical and critical, a constructive form of this philosophy offers a more practical guide for solving social problems. China offers a unique reason for hope in the world today. Chinese intellectuals are not as closely tied to a mechanistic view of the world as their counterparts in the West. In thinking about the future shape of Chinese society, scholars in your country are open to questions that are not even considered in my country. Thus, China seems to be one of the few places in the world today where fundamental philosophical questions about public philosophy are being addressed. So I am eager to engage in dialogue with Chinese scholars, and that means you, so that we might learn from each other. Thank you.
，确实榨取一切资源的外国公司，获得了与投入非常不成比例的高额利润，留下的是巨大的债务，然后签署给欧美一些公司特别占领的合同，啊，那么使用美国军事力量，颠覆试图脱离殖民主义体系的中国，所以他们这部。这影片的啊，这么一个观点就是，贫困是什么呢？就是世界极端发展不平衡所导致的结果。这种不平衡使得强国能够从弱国榨取经济利润，这是一个一部非常好的片子啊。我们到时候会有一些嗯，这个呃剧本的一些这个英文的啊答疑资料会准备在那里啊，希望大家有时间的话可以去看一下。好，那么现在我就把时间，嗯，留给各位同学，然后就是有什么问题的话，啊，我们现在可以去提一下问题。嗯、好，啊，大家有问题可以问一下。
Cliff 说呢，他的观点和那个凯恩斯并没有区别，也就是说呢，他并不是说凯恩斯他讲到的是一个混合经济，而是说呢，他所。他所提出的是如何阻止失业率，也就是说呢，如何为那个很更多的人民创造更多的那个就业机会。然后他也讲到说，凯恩斯他啊本身自己并没有提出混合经济这个概念，而是说呢，呃，后来的经济学家他用这个凯。凯因斯他的理论来评价说，就是现在的经济，也就是说呢，嗯，他认为凯恩斯他提出的是一种啊一般性的理论，而不是说具体的、具体的措施。也就是说呢，呃，我们是要把这个经济看作是一个整体，而不是个，而不是个体的集合。我们的这个 Cliff 先生呢，他一向是非常反对说个体主义的那种看法。另外呢，我们刚才那位同学他也讲到了说，如果说啊、呃、只需要那个一般原则的话，那么我们如何来做出具体的行为呢？然后 Cliff Cliff 呢，他就说，如果说你连一般的原则你都不知道的话，那你又从何而来具体的行为呢？也就是说，我们要首先明白这个具体的理论和这个原则，才能够进行具体的行为。I I also want to say that if if you study if you if you study If you study economics and you read about Keynes in a textbook, what you are really reading about is the ideas of Keynes' followers, not Keynes. And while Keynes was still alive, he told his followers, "You are completely wrong. <laughs> you have completely misunderstood what I am saying." Your models are all static models. Static, stay in place, no change. My model is a model of short-term change, not the long run, the short run. So he repudiated. He said they were wrong to all of his followers. So it is very difficult to actually understand Keynes's ideas. 嗯，刚才他补充说明说，如果说我们在座有那个经济学的同学的话，你们在课本上面学到的凯恩斯的所有理论，并不是他本身的，而是说他的后来者的，或者是说他的继承者的。如果说凯恩斯先生他活着的话，肯定他就会对那些人说，你们对我的理解通通都是错误的，因为凯恩斯呢，他的理论主要是针对于短期的、短期过程中的经济。经济行为，而不是一个长期的。所以说呢，如果我们想理解凯恩斯的话，但是从你们课本上面学到的东西，实际上是不能够达到这个目的的。Uh, Culture of freedom, or politics, form of democracy, marketing economy, or environment protection. But、um, uh, it seems that、uh, there are some、uh, successful countries who have copied the, the model of U.S. such as、uh, Japan or Southern Korea, you know, who has the democracy or the marketing、uh, economy.、Uh, my question, my. <laughs> Uh, my question consists of two branches. First is,、uh, uh, do you see that USA is a model or nation、uh, for for nation which has had a, a thicker foundation of thousands of years of history and which is like a paper painted over colorfully? Second question is,、uh, what do you see is、uh, the biggest obstacle for those nations of long history? Uh, to learn from from USA, which is、uh, so modernized, but only has、uh, more than two hundred years of history, and、uh, which is a paper so new. That's my question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
跟我们讲一遍吧。<笑>就是我的问题就是，呃，在单一世界，美国一直是世界的领导者，成为就成为世界整个的一个学习的一个典范。那么似乎也有一些一些国家，就是成为这个典范的一个一个，就是一个很成功的例子，似乎很很成功。比如说像日本、像韩国这些国家。那么我们中国最近也在，似乎好像也在学美国。那么我想问的第一个问题就是，美国是不是就是这样一个是？以像中国这样有几千年这样一个一个文化的这样一个国家的这样一个学习的典范，那么因为啊，但是对中国来说，这张纸又不是那么白，而且已经画了很多道了。那第二个问题就是，那么呃，嗯，就是最大的障碍，对于像中国这样的有这么丰厚的这样一个文化基础这样一个国家，那么最大的障碍，如果要去学美国的话，那么它的障碍在哪里？Do you understand? I think so. Mm -hmm. The United States it is not a good model for anyone. <laughs> I think I think the same is generally true for Europe as well. I think these are the old models that it is very difficult for Western countries to overcome the ideas that they created. So real change can only come from truly new ideas. And I don't think new ideas will generally come from the United States and Europe. I, I hope they will come from China. Um, whether美国还是欧洲都不是我们学习的典范，因为他们所具有的那些观点都是已经是在过去产生的，而且是说已经过时了的。现在的新情况呢，我们需要新的观点，而不是说走他们的老路。然后 Cliff 先生呢，希望说这种新的观点呢，他觉得是不可能再在美国和欧洲产生的，而且呢，他希望他会在中国诞生。那么呢，也就是希望在座的各位同学要多加努力啊。还有问题吗？还没讲完。完了。他没回答完。他没回答完。Yeah. Oh. Um, I, do, I don't think the answer for China can be simply to return to the to the to return to the 19th century or before. I don't think the answer for China is to restore the Qing Dynasty. You can't go back 150 years. So the problem is not simply to, to learn Chinese traditions again. It is to combine Chinese traditions with Western thought. I am troubled when I see in China it seems that some intellectuals only want to follow Western ideas. That is a serious problem, in my view. He says that China does not want to go back to the 19th century, or the 19th century, or the 19th century, or the 19th century. That is to say, if you are just learning to learn, 学习西方，或者说是单纯的回归传统呢？他觉得这两种方法都是不可行的。最好的方法呢，是要把传统和现代结合起来。然后他觉得说，现在中国有很多学者呢，他们都是只是想单纯的学习西方，他觉得这样是不行的。他认为这是对中国的现状来说是一个很大的问题，可能就是这位同学讲的，你你说的那个阻碍。
if you were in charge of the Ministry of Economic in the current Chinese government, what policy would you, would you like to take to realize your thoughts about the economy as far as the global crisis of the economy? Do you think the four, uh, about 4,000 billion uh, yuan in, uh, <laughs> by the Kentucky, by the Chinese government, will work to eliminate the effects? Thank you. Um, I would divide the problem into two components, short-term and long-term. The answer to the short-term question is, I don't know. <laughs> there is almost no experience to say how to deal with this problem once it happens. The long-term problem is, to, is a structural change to prevent this kind of thing from happening again. And I can't explain in detail, but the most important feature is to increase the income of the poorest people in China, to increase the internal market, to reduce reliance on the export market. Uh 也就是说，使中国的经济不要那么完全的依赖于出口。I don't think the problems of the Chinese economy are a mirror or exactly the same as those in the American economy. So my, I suspect that the same solutions that will work in the United States right now may not work for China. Um. 中国的经济和和那个美国的经济并不一样，也就是说，中国经济并不是美国经济的镜呃镜子。所以说呢，如果说是现在在美国享用来解决的方法呢，可能对中国来说是不适用的。In recent years, you know, uh, China has been working hard and creatively at involving a system that works for China at this stage of its development. <laughs> so, so, in your opinion, um, what should we do to affirm the old traditions and make new beginnings? Or say, which is the best way for us to uh, bring the values of our history to the care of our times? Um, I don't, if I knew the answer, I would have told you already. <laughs> but 
for example, there has been a recent um, statement of interest in the ideas of Kongzi at the national level by Hu Jintao. <laughs> and I think that's important that the government is no longer saying that Marx is the only source of wisdom. But for Marx and Confucius to get married is going to be very difficult. <laughs> They, they are going to fight a lot. But some kind of marriage like that is important. Cliff said,他现在也不知道这个答案是什么,但是他提到说像我们的胡锦涛主席的话,他在他的讲话之中呢,就试图把这个儒家学说,你说孔子的 学说和就是我们现在中国的实际结合起来，但是他觉得说是想把马克思和孔子拉到一块去呢，这个是非常困难的，可能他们两个会打架啊。但是说呢，这个两者之间的一些结合，对我们现在的发展是很有利的。但是
maybe you could find 10 different thinkers. So it depends on how, what, the, what the question means exactly. Yeah, so you mean it is possible for a rich China to adopt it for we like that, right? Well, the general principle of moder <coughs> modern thought said reject tradition. Postmodern thought said don't reject tradition, include tradition and modern thought and combine them. It's very difficult. No one knows exactly how to do that, but it will require a lot of work, but that's an aim to, to achieve. Okay. 他在这里做了一个比较the second question is, uh, you said you don't agree with the mixed economy style, right? And uh, the two kinds are uh, liberal, liberal views and uh, the uh, socialist, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know that China, China is a socialist country. And, uh, but uh, we have adopted a way that um, mixed both the uh, liberal, liberal way and uh, the so-called socialist way. Because we can tell it from our society, uh, we also take take the uh, some powerful monetary policies, uh, but at the same time, we at, uh, actually it is most of the time we want it, we want the monkey to, to function by itself. But sometimes, like this uh, this time, the crisis, the economy crisis, we have to um, use the monetary policy or some other ways to control it. So we adopted the, both the ways. I mean that is a kind of mixed ways. So you mean you don't you don't you don't you are not for it, right? Or I I, I misunderstood okay. you. Every economy in the world today is a mixed economy. It balances some aspects of capitalism and some aspects of socialism. Right. So I am saying the next stage in evolution is going to be different from both socialism and capitalism. If, if we remain where we are today, economies will continue to have serious problems and other problems, environmental problems, for example. So I'm suggesting that a mixed economy has been has not been very successful because there is a constant, either leaders pushed in the, in the direction of socialism for a while, they find that doesn't work. Then they, take, then they push in the direction of a free market for a while and they find problems with that. So they keep going back and forth. This, this has been going on for 200 years. And if both, if both directions don't look very good, I would look for a third direction. Uh, okay, okay. But I, in my opinion, I think there's only three ways of developing economy. Like one is the um, so socialism, the so-called socialism, and the second is the uh, let it, just let it market alone, let the economy alone, and to make it function uh, by itself. And the third way is to mix them. Mixed both of them. So there's only three ways. So what is the other way? Where is the, the other way? The, the other way is to start with different principles, different philosophical premises. 
That's, that's what my lecture was about. My, my argument is that postmodernism offers a different way to think about the structure of an economy. I did not go into detail. I only had a short time. I didn't want to spend eight hours to explain it. Uh, 他说克里夫他说他在讲座之中今天这种很严峻的情况下呢某个国家采用那种后现代的理论来创造第三种方法也就是说呢资本主义第三条路就是两者的结合There are, there are certainly people in the United States who are still fighting the Cold War in their mind. They need to have an enemy somewhere. So as soon as the Cold War ended, they said, oh, we don't like Muslims. And China looks dangerous. <laughs> so there are 
I don't know. I mean, it's a complicated question. Why does, a, why does America need an enemy? But there are a lot of Americans who look at the world that way. Their source, their source of meaning as a nation comes by having an enemy. So, some of them think China is an enemy, I think. I don't know those people, but I, I read about them, so I'm sure they exist. And some of them are in our government. And I think they're crazy, but I can't, I can't take them out, so uh, I have to live with that. But, so yes, there are Americans who think China is to blame for everything, unless they blame Iran or Muslims in general or the French. But someone else is to blame, never us. That's the idea of a lot of Americans. Personally, I think the United States is the most dangerous country in the world. <laughs> I don't think that's difficult to see, actually. We have a military that runs around trying to help everyone by killing them, so... <laughs> I, I, anyway, it, American, a lot of Americans cannot see who we are and what, what, how, must, how we appear to the world. So if they think that China is a problem, they are the ones who have a problem, in my view. Um,这位同学主要想问说，想想知道大部分西方人或者说是美国人对待中国或者说中国经济是什么看法？然后Cliff呢，他就是回答说的是，呃，他认识一些这样的人，也就是说呢，把中国或者说是呃。穆斯林看作是他们的假想敌的那些人，或者是说，呃，自从该怎么说？虽然那个冷战结束已经很久了，但是呢，他觉得说，在很多人的脑袋里面呢，还是存在这个冷战的这种概念，觉得说是世界上
um, they um, during a uh, song time they transport a uh, very sharp way. So, um, um, so this example gives us a different uh, wheel. So, um, would you like to introduce your wheels?嗯，这个克里伯特说呢，呃，如果我们假设我们改革如果的成功，我们必须尽可能的接近我们的传统。但是就我们看来呢，就是在呃上次就是日本他们改革就是在一个很短的时间内完成了很巨大的变革。他的